But last week we talked about the keys to a good 2023. You remember that? And the first one on the list was to faith forward. I don't know where I got that term. I just like rhyming stuff or, or using F's or P's or whatever. What's that called when you... Alliteration? Man, we got some high school educated folk in here. Well, anyway, we talked about faith forward. And that's what we're going to uh, key in on today. Our faith. Because we got to move forward in faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. If we want to have a, a good... 2023, we got to consider our faith. And consider who, who do you have your faith in, first of all? I mean, if you don't have your faith in God, then you don't have a guarantee. But I'm going to tell you, I got my faith in God, and God is a guarantee. He ain't ever lied to me. His promises always come to pass. It may not be in my time schedule, in my, my way of thinking, but God is able to, to deliver. Say, God, I put my faith in you. I belong to you. I give myself away. I am yours. That's a good declaration for this year. Faith unlocks the promises of God. Have you ever looked in this book? It's chock full of promises for your life. When I got saved and, and found out all these things that I didn't know my whole life, that this was a word from God and that God loved me and God forgave me, I got in this book, man, I couldn't wait to read the page. I remember the first time I went through the, the Bible as a whole, man, I was just like hungry. I was like, I want to read that again, but I got to keep going. And I couldn't read, wait to read it through the second time. And if I'm honest, I'm probably on somewhere in the 30s or 40s time through this thing and it's still good to me every time i'm still getting revelation it's still working in my life the promises of god are in this book and if he didn't promise it guess what you can't expect it that's where the some of the faith circles have got offline they start saying well i'm believing god for a bmw you know i'm believing god for this or that well did god promise you that Now, sometimes he will speak to you and, and give you a word in your heart about something, right? But if it ain't God, don't expect it from God. And it, if it ain't according to God's will. So those are, those are qualifying statements there about faith. If he hadn't promised it, don't expect it. But if we don't read his word, we don't know what the promises are. And we don't know the promiser. Because the Word of God reveals the character of the one we're placing our trust in. We go from faith to faith. We grow in our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You see it. You speak it. You hear it. It's planted in your heart. Faith is planted in your heart. And the harvest that you're reaping right now in your life... It's from the words that you have spoken out of that, that garden in your heart. You see, faith is important about the outcome of your life. Now, faith comes by hearing is in Romans 10, 17. But in Romans 1, 17, we say, the good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. From start to finish. From start to finish. The moment you gave your heart to Jesus, you were made right with God. And then you begin this process called sanctification where you're getting more right with God. You're learning to walk closer with God. And it's from start to finish by faith. And as the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. And that's what you want. The world's full of death and darkness. But you want life and peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the life that we choose. And we simply need to believe. So what is faith? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. To some of you guys, you could preach this, I know. 
And that's good. You should be preaching this. I tell you what, I'm going to get Rick up here and preach one day. That guy's on fire. <laughs> I can tell. Rick, it's just bubbling out of you. You can't stop it. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to put a, a chain on your foot and yank you down from up there. He's like, you're going to preach my whole message. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to read it out of the King James. Now faith. What time? What time is it? Now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the substance of things hoped for. Now you say, well, I'm just hoping it ain't here yet. I don't have no proof of it. Your faith is the substance. Your faith is the substance. Your faith brings the promises of God off the pages of Scripture and into your reality. That unlocks the key to heaven is your faith. God's hand is moved by your faith. And you, and you can look at somebody and you can, you can ask them what they're believing and you'll see a little bit down the road is that's what they're living. And if I ask you today, what are you thinking about 2023? I'm believing and I'm going to serve God with my whole heart. My family's going to, relationships are going to change. My finances are going to be good. God's going to take, meet our needs according to His riches and glory. You're, going, you're speaking faith then I see the substance of it right there. It's just a matter of time until it comes out of the spiritual realm into your natural. You have already unlocked the key. It is the substance of where you're trying to get to. Your faith declaration. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. God took nothing and spoke everything into existence by faith. He framed the world. What are your words framing in your life? I dare you to look back and, and listen to, to what you've been saying. And see if it ain't what you've been getting. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So, you know, the world is like, if I can't see it, I won't believe it. But that's not Christians. Christians, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we live by believing, not seeing. We don't have to see it to believe. We praise God on this end, this side of the Red Sea. You know, those that died in the wilderness, they were moaning and complaining on this side, and God opened the Red Sea for them. And then they celebrated on the other side. But we ought not be like that. Faith celebrates the victory now. Faith says, I got the substance already. It's as good as in my hand, though I can't see it. The promises of God are mine. Because I believe. Why did God make promises if He wasn't willing to give it to you, huh? He didn't. It says it's His good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants to give you the promises. But faith is what moves His hand. It's impossible to please Him without it. Where does your faith lie? Well, you don't have to tell us. We can see by your actions. Because faith generates works. Wherever your faith lies, that's where your actions are going to be. It, it's evident about what you're investing your life into. Is your faith in the American dream? Well, I'm going to save up a bunch of money and I'm going to retire. Is your faith in your 401k, your bank account? Well, we can tell. Because that's what you spend all your time investing into. 
Is it in your job? Has your job become your God? Is it the doctors? I'm not saying jobs or doctors or bank accounts or the, you know, wanting to have something for yourself in America. I'm not saying any of that is bad unless that's where you're placing your faith. See, your faith is in God. What did he say just a while ago? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. But some of us have done got it backwards, and now we're seeking the stuff. Right? That's why I was saying this is a new year for you. A fresh anointing, a fresh surrender, so that you can get priorities back in your life. And God can work the promises in your life. Some people are trusting in their relationships, their abilities. God gave you relationships and abilities, so He wants them to be blessed. But you got to put Him in the center of all of it. He's the wheel within the wheel. Now let me ask you a question about the church, all you passionites. If these banners are God's will for us as a church, and I believe with my whole heart they are, and our faith, we profess to be in God, and our allegiance and surrender is to God, then our involvement in the processes that He's given us to bring these to pass is proof of, our, proof of our faith. Then we will do the works that God has asked us to do collectively. So in light of that, is your church attendance, your life group attendance, is that just a personal preference? Well, I like to go to church twice a month and that's good for me. Are you here just to get well, I just get mine every now and then. I'm good. Me and God got our thing on the side. But what about what God is asking of you? He said, I will build my church. So is your life group attendance and your church attendance, is that just a personal preference? Or is it an indication of where your faith lies? You know what? It could be said like this, faithfulness is proof of your faith. It's a good, a good time of the year to just turn some things around. God's not mad. No condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. I'm just saying. This is the year that we're going to pull it all together. I believe that. I'm believing for each one of us to step up and to meet the promises of God in our life. Now, our faith is not in our works, obviously. Some people put their faith in their works. They think, well, I'm right with God because I do this or because I do that. No. Our faith is in God. Our work and faithfulness simply align us with God and become the substance of our things hoped for. Faith without works is dead. The devils believe and tremble, but they don't come to church. <laughs> well, some of them do, I guess. Some churches might be more devils than... <laughs> no, never mind. <clears throat> All right, so we're going we're gonna to talk today about Abram, which was, his name was later changed to Abraham. Now, I know we've talked about him a lot recently. Uh, that's because he's important. He's known as the father of our faith. And as I begin to look into uh, the story of Abraham found in Genesis, you know, early portions of Genesis 13 through, I don't know, somewhere in the 20s, the stories of Abraham and, and his faith journey, I begin to see parallels to my personal life and your personal life. And what we can learn. Are you ready to embark on a journey of faith through the life of Abram? Well, the first thing we've talked about a lot recently is just the decision that he made to follow God in the first place. How he was 70-something years old and God came to him and said, Abram, I want you to leave Haran. That was the, the town he was living in. And I want you to go to a place that I will show you. He didn't even tell him where. 
I want you to walk with me. And so at 70-something years old, that would seem late in life to most of us, wouldn't it? Some of us may be sitting there saying, well, I wasted so many years of my life. I hadn't followed God. It's really too late. My life is over. We, we get so finite-minded. But God is saying, no, nope, the time is now. Always will be. Now is the time. Your time is now. Uh, who was it? Moses was 80 before he saw the burning bush and started his ministry to deliver the children of Egypt, out of Egypt. So don't be saying, well, I'm too old for all this. No, no. The time is now. And I was thinking, I looked up that word Haran, the name of that town. Do you know what it means? Haran in the Hebrew means crossroads. Isn't that neat? He was at a crossroad. Are you going to continue to just live your life on your terms and allow a little of God, enough, enough of God into my life to know, to know I'm going to heaven? I got that ticket, right? Are you going to allow just enough of God in, but, but you're not going to take that whole hog road? You're not going all in. There's no, no real surrender. You know, I'm still sitting on the throne, but I'll, I'll, I'll go to church. But I'm going to make the decisions. And God asked, will you leave your family and all the life that you had planned and will you follow me? You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, he didn't say, come follow me and I'll make you rich. Come follow me and I got a new investment opportunity. He said, come follow me. And we look back and we think, man, if I was one of those people and Jesus himself said, come follow me, I'd have left everything. Don't you feel that way? I, man, I'd have gave up my car and my guitar and <laughs> I'd have given up my whole life to walk with Jesus if I'd have been there. But what's different about us today? We can still walk with Jesus and he's still asking the same thing. And today, maybe for some of you, it is your crossroads. Maybe today you said, well, I got the ticket to heaven. I've got enough faith for my salvation. I know Jesus is Lord. But He hadn't become Lord yet in my life. I haven't been converted. Only you know about your life. Is anybody in here have a quick testimony they'd like to share about how church, you believed God and your life was going along and church was, you know, just part of your routine or, and, or maybe wasn't, you know, you believed in God. But then there come a time, something happened that you, you got to a crossroad in your life and you said, I'm all in. I surrender. I give myself away. And how your life changed. Anybody have a good testimony? Come up here. Come on, somebody come share a minute or two. I can look, I can look around, I could call about 12 or 15 of you right now and know you got a good testimony. Because some of you are, are, are all in. Two minutes. No. All right, time's up. No. <laughs> well, Many of you know that Greg and I were married for 20 years, got a divorce, and remarried after about six years. And that was really hard. God woke me up in the middle of the night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and told me to call him to get back together with him. And my heart was longing to be back together with him. And I was like, no, I'm not calling him. Went back to bed. Finally, when I called him that Thursday, in the middle of the night, he's a truck driver. His phone is turned off. He is not awake in the middle of the night. He's not waiting for a phone call in the middle of the night. Thursday, I called him, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, whatever it was in the middle of the night, and he answered the phone. I've been waiting for your call. Like, what took you so long? And I shared with him that, you know, I'd been longing for him and wanting to get back together with him. And at that moment, he accepted me back, and we were back together. 
got rid of everything in North Carolina. He was already planning on moving to Hernando, Mississippi. And I started facilitating getting rid of everything and he came and we drove all across town, across the states from there to here, got remarried. So don't ever sell God short. When I was young, I said I was never gonna get married and never gonna have kids. You remember that, I see Cindy laughing. But look, if I had stuck to my plan, not only would God have not shown himself in our selfishness after 20 years, you know, I want this, I want this, and this isn't working and I'm done, to him changing our hearts, bringing us back together. But before that, we had Sarah and Nicholas and Nicholas, as y'all know, is like wholeheartedly serving the Lord. And he had a life and death situation when he was a baby, 50-50 chance to live or die. The little boy next to us died. Nicholas, 18 months old, two years old, he says, you know, he's asking me, did we tell him about Jesus? We hadn't, because we were all wrapped up in our son and our problems. That never happened again that whole time of his recovery and his chemotherapy and all the stuff that we went through with him. We always told everybody about Jesus at that point. We talked to people and made sure. And so I just want to encourage y'all, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're going through, God's always there for you. He's always with you. And there's always something better that he has for you. Don't give up on it. Amen. Thank you. You get to the crossroads and you say, am I going my, the way I usually go, the way I want to go, or am I going with God? You got a testimony? All of us will go through many crossroads in our lifetime. <clears throat> and each one that we make the right decision on, it takes us to another one. And, uh, and we just keep going on and staying in his will. Um, all of, most of you know that my husband and I uh, went to Venezuela and lived. But when I first got an invitation to go to Venezuela and minister uh, from a friend that had moved there, I didn't want to go, you know. I said, I thought, no, what am I going to do there, you know? So I didn't pray. I didn't do anything. And then I knew that I had to tell Seal and uh, that I got an invitation and to go there. And he says, I just think that will be wonderful, Marsha, for you to go to minister there. And I thought, okay, great. And I thought, well, I was working at that time in the bank and you couldn't get two weeks off at a time. So, so I went to the bank and talked to my leader and she says, that's just wonderful, Marsha. This is just a wonderful opportunity for you, for you to go. You can take as long as you want to take wow. off. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I went and finally talked to God, and I said, well, God, you know I don't really want to go over there. And, but I'm not going to fast. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in praying. I'm just going to lift it, kind of lift it up for you. And so I said, Lord. And he says, I have called you into that land, and you're going to go reap where you have not sown. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and so then I contacted them, and I went and saw more people saved that time. And up till that time, then I had my whole Christian life, except at Billy Graham crusades. <laughs> yeah. Amen. I like that. There's many crossroads that you come to. I fell asleep several years ago where I didn't really have a church home, but I was a Christian. I became a Christian when I was a teenager. I had made some poor life choices, married some people I shouldn't have married, you know, and wasn't Christian and didn't really follow the world's world. I had my mind, I thought, well, maybe I can lead these people to God. But God says, don't do it like that, you know, don't be unequally yoked. But that's where I didn't listen. It was a marriage falling apart, lots of poor choices making. And at some point, you know, I changed jobs. I went to work for a railroad. And I lasted my first month and a half there. I got hurt. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And, my, and I got a dream at night where God was just showed me, and I didn't understand it at the time. Because we were working out at the one off, off Riverport down there, CNCSX. And they were 
they would unload shipping containers off the trains, what we would do, and stack them on the yard. And some of us had to get out and go climb on the trains and go unlock them, throw the locks and things. And that's where I got hurt, was I fell off the rail car. And about the, the managers were pressuring me to go back to doing it and everything. The doctors were saying, hold off. And I prayed on it, you know. And I wasn't a faithful Christian girl. I just praying and talking to God. And I got a dream one night, you know, that said, and I didn't understand it. This night was to, in the dream, I was being told, I was like, a, you know, you go to your, it, it like holidays, you go, everybody meets at a family member's house, whatnot, typically. We went over at my aunt's house. And my wife at the time, our kids, we were all there. And my aunt, that was, you know, the only people I knew out of like three dozen people there in the dream. Everybody didn't have no faces. And I didn't understand that. But the aunt came outside in the dream and said, you know, it's a big storm getting ready to happen. Y'all need to get in the house. And next thing I know, before I, everybody got in the house, but before I could get in the house, the wind had been picked up so bad that I couldn't get in. And I was clawing, literally, with stepping stones and everything to get to the house. And when I finally got in, I was looking around, and all these people at the kitchen table didn't have no faces. My aunt told my wife at the time, a kid, take the kids and go to the back room. And sat here and I looked around some more and there's people were doing like witchcraft, Ouija board stuff at the kitchen table and I didn't understand it. And I look out and I could see the street on the other window and there was a man in the street just like controlling this storm. I mean, tornadoes like you wouldn't believe. Couldn't understand it. Like what did I say? What are you? And I looked over at the guys at the kitchen table and I said, what are you doing? This is man said, this is obviously a supernatural storm and you gotta fight fire with fire. I said, no. God says, this is an abomination. You got to stop doing this. You cannot do that. You cannot go against evil with more evil. And I didn't, I did not understand this. I didn't know this stuff. And then my aunt come and got me, put me in this little closet, like a pantry closet. And I stepped back in and I got in that pantry closet, tornado hit the house. My closet is ripped away from the house and it just goes spinning and stomping and everything. And when I finally it had come to a stop, I was out at my job at the time. And I had done, and I opened the door. And I just crashed through all them shipping containers. And when I stepped out, I'm just amazingly, I'm fine. Didn't really understand again. And I'm face to face with that man that was standing in the street controlling the storm. And all I did was just mention God. And I just said, I don't know, was, thank God or something. I don't remember exactly what I said several years ago to him in the dream. But he just kind of smiled and disappeared and everything was fine. Well, I woke up, didn't understand it. About three weeks passed by and my boss, the one that pressured me to go back to doing what I was doing, offered me a position, said, hey, I want you to stand, you know, we want to change your position because your shoulder's not going to get better for a long time and we don't want to lose you. They offered me a position to stand out there, park a truck and stop all the incoming drivers coming in and ask them where to go. And I was like, okay, you know, I did it for a couple of weeks and I was like, something's off. So I prayed about it. I had a lot of time between the truck drivers. And I said, what's that? And I asked God, I said, what does that dream mean? And then he told me, he said, all those nameless faces you've seen, you didn't understand. Everything that happened, he said, I'm controlling this storm. I had to get you away from it because I started, me and my wife split at that point too. That started to split, things have more gone downhill. But he said, I defeated this for you. All those destroyed shipping containers, that was me defeating this for you. Now all those nameless faces, all those people that you've seen in that house, that's these drivers because there's too many for you to remember them. I want you to mention me just like you did at that table and to that man in that street. Mention me to him on that. I did. And I started seeing miracles. I started seeing things. And I don't have you guys know that at the point, at that point in my life, I had no idea how I would survive. I didn't make enough money to make it on my own. And me and my wife, we finally split. I tell you, I was, I slept on my buddy's couch for less than a month before I was closing on a house who in the mortgage company less than one year prior had said, you don't have enough credit. There's nothing you can do. But God had taken care of me. When I finally followed his will and did what he said do, and he was showing me signs to get away from him, he said, I got you. 
And that's one of the things, why, one of the very reasons why I always say, I got you. Because that's what God said to me, I got you. Hmm. Take care of it. Trust in him. His word, his word will never, ever fail. But you got to take that leap of faith, that step. And you do it. And his, not one time in history can any person in this room or in this planet say, hey, well, God didn't do what he said he would do. No matter what the devil throws in front of him, in front of you, he cannot, not the devil, not anything supernatural, anything on this world can stand in the way of the word of God. Not nothing. I don't care who you are, what you are, how powerful you are. You are not, you cannot stand in the way of the word of God. Nothing can stop him. Nothing can stop his promises. That's right. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> Sometimes God visits us in dreams and visions. I often pray that for knuckleheads who won't listen any other way. Lord, visit them. Speak to them in their dreams, you know. A lot of people are just running from God. He has to put you in a little closet every now and then so you can hear. Uh, but he is actively working in your life in the sooner that we get on board, the sooner it unlocks, our faith unlocks those promises of God like we've been saying. Anybody else have a short testimony? No, that's fine. That's fine. Well, I just want to say that um, I had a rough life like other people have, but I, um, I put myself away from God because I took my anger out on God. Um, and I just want to say it took me a long time God brought me here. I know God brought me here, you know, and I'm serving the Lord. And um, I love Jesus with all my heart, you know, and um, I just want to say that, you know, you, God will reach out to you. I, I used to just, I was so angry at God for what happened to me at another church years ago, with, you know, and um, I got away from church and I stayed away from church and I was just so mad at God for what happened. You know, and um, I just want to say that I came here and I got saved and Pastor Guy helped me out through some situations that, you know, in my past. And I just want to say that I love Jesus. I really love Jesus. You know, I got good friends and good family. And, um, you know, I got two grandsons that are here today whom I love very dearly. And um, I'm just praising that God will, you know, I know God will work on my other family members, you know. And I just want to just say, you know, thank you for Passion Church. And I just want to thank Jesus for everything. Amen. Let's shift gears. Let, let's let somebody up here that has a testimony of, of how they gave their heart to Jesus and they, they went whole hog and they made a decision for Jesus, but then, then everything crashed on them. As all you know, I went through a pretty tough period recently, and I'm on my way back. And Pastor and Angie stopped by the house and brought me some taco soup. I'm holding out of that bowl waiting for a refill. <laughs> and I could lift my arm above my head for the first time since my car wreck. I totaled my vehicle. I was incarcerated for a while in a state institution. Wasn't real happy about it. And my understanding was people that I loved they were doing it for my own sake, to rescue me from the situation that I put myself in, because I allowed the attack of the enemy in. And when he came after me, he came after me hard, and it was just like my whole world fell apart. I wrecked my house from one end to the other. I wouldn't even let anybody in my house, because in my mind, I was building it up. I wasn't tearing it down, but I tore it down. So. There's light at the end of the tunnel, people. Amen. I hope you don't mind me sharing a little bit, but uh, she had a fall. She hit her head on the concrete floor, and she's had mental uh, issues because of that. And uh, it's been a, a tough road for her. And uh, that's not the testimony that God didn't do what he said he's going to do. I was just being facetious about that. That is God working with you through your issues 
and still sending people to, to love you and to help you through everything and to turn it around. And the fact that you're still here today is a mighty testimony of God's grace and goodness and that you're getting better every day. And I just thank, I thank you guys in the church who have loved Mary Ellen through a very, very difficult season in her life. And I thank you, Mary Ellen, for not giving up on God and proving that, that, that he's a God of the turnaround. Well, I'll cut this off if there's no more testimonies. I know there are. Maybe we'll save it for a different time. Abram didn't know where God was leading. He didn't know how much it would cost. And it takes a huge step to begin a journey of faith. We can say we're on a journey of faith, but if we're not putting our faith out there and believing God and hearing from God and hearing God's plan and seeking God's things, then we're not on a journey of faith. And we're not being faithful. Trust is the first step. You have to truly trust that God has, that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So if you... Say, I trust you, God. You will diligently seek him. Now, do we get everything right? Absolutely not. Abram, when he left, he was obedient. He took the right road, but you know what he did? He took his nephew Lot with him. And, he had, and God had clearly told him, you know, don't leave your family and go to a place where I will show you. He took his nephew with him. That was partial obedience. Maybe he, his, he really liked his nephew Lot. He was... One of his helpers or something, we don't know. But we would see later on uh, that it would cost him. He, he would have wished that he wouldn't have brought his nephew Lot <laughs> after a while, after he had to rescue the boy and almost get, put his life on the line for him and all that and all the trouble and heartache. Partial obedience is not full obedience. And God wants total obedience but he's merciful. And he did not cast away Abram because he started off with partial obedience. For years, Abram sojourned with God in some real times of famine. We're going to talk later next week more about the lessons we can learn here. But we see that Abram, not everything just became wonderful because he followed God. What we see was Abram was put up on the potter's wheel. And his life began to change. But change in our life sometimes comes through things that we don't like. God getting his hand into our business and squeezing out the things and the impurities that don't belong in our life. He's character building. But I guess the question that we'll leave with today is, have you gotten to that first step? Have you gotten to a crossroads yet where you said, I am following the Lord. As for me and my house... Have you made that firm declaration that I'm going with God? I think we would be surprised at how many people say that they are. But God is not in their decision-making counsel. But today is a new day. And now is the time. It's the beginning of a new year. We felt God's presence. We know God's love. We know God's vision for us as a people. We see God's promises that they're yes and amen. They're yes if we say amen. If we by faith will take hold and not let go of the horns of the altar, the faith journey, is it the easy journey? No. But neither is, you know, driving yourself into the ground through drugs and alcohol addiction and divorce and, and bad decisions one after another stacked on top of each other. The world is hurting. But we, of all people, as God's people, if we will 
Stand at the crossroads and choose this day whom you will serve. If you will walk with God today and get up and walk with Him again tomorrow, Jesus is saying, follow me. And begin this process of sanctification. And let God have His way. Stay on the potter's wheel. And He will make something very, very beautiful out of your life.